both know I got somewhere else to go But I got something to tell you That I never thought I would But I believe you really ought to know I love you I honestly love you And welcome. If you set out to uh, create the typical Aussie girl who was pretty and fresh and bright and open, full of life and full of fun, I think you'd finish up with Olivia Newton-John. Maybe that's why she became Australia's golden girl. And although she went off to America and married Matt, we still revel in her super, super success. 25 million records plus, the hottest star in the world in the 70s, everything from Grammys to Greece. It seems every generation of Aussie kids have fallen in love with Sandy and Danny Zuko, haven't they? Have your kids done that right through? It's amazing. Quite amazing to watch them sing along with You're the One That I Want and all those other hits from Greece. Now, there's a rule on television, too, about ratings, that music concerts never work on television. For some reason, they don't. Everyone from Mick Jagger to Bruce Springsteen have tried and failed in the ratings. There used to be only two exceptions to that rule. Elvis, if he came back, he'd probably rate. And Olivia Newton-John. Well, last month, John Farnham joined that select pair. His concert for Rwanda was a ratings runaway success. But tonight, the one that we want is Miss Olivia Newton-John. <laughs> Welcome.
I mentioned earlier, as you were coming out, that, that you, John Farnham, Elvis, mm -hmm. that's not a bad trio, is it? Oh, God, that'd be a great song, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> that's very nice to be in that crowd, yes. If we could get you back together, all three of you, would you? <laughs> I love it. I think a couple of years ago they thought that maybe I would be joining Elvis, but I'm not going to be joining Elvis. <laughs> I'm happy to be in that group. With John Farnham. All right. Yeah. I guess we, let's talk about John, the, um, the boy next door, you're the girl next door. I mean, a lot of similarities. I guess the main difference is that John Farnham always forgets his words. You know, don't I? Dare I tell? Dare I tell? <laughs> Do you really? Actually, I have. I have. But it's very embarrassing. In fact, it's always been a f kind of phobic thing, at least when I used to perform live, which I haven't done for years. But it used to be that when until I used to... Until tonight. Until tonight, of course. <laughs> but um, I used to write lyrics on my hands, you know, I'd, I'd, like songs that I knew. I'd sung them a thousand times, but I still used to worry about forgetting them. And I d it did happen once. What did you do? Um, I just looked at the audience and went, and, and they sang it for me, and I, and I found it. And, <laughs> And after that, it kind of broke the ice, and I, I wasn't as afraid after that. You, uh, nerves? You're not nervous? Um, singing? I used to be. I mean, I haven't done it a long time. I actually enjoy singing now, but I haven't performed live, apart from that one concert I did with you recently. I haven't done a concert in ten years, really, apart from maybe four songs. Well, something like I Honestly Love You, I suppose. Was that the biggest hit of yours? I think that, and you're the one that I want, probably. The Grease songs were probably the largest, and physical, of course. Or, or physical, yeah. of course. <laughs> did you really, honestly, win a Hayley Mills look-alike <laughs> contest here I in did. Melbourne? I did. Hayley uh, Mills, why? <clears throat> well, when I was about 10, I looked very much like her. And my sister actually sent my photograph in. They had a contest. One of the, the theatre chains had a contest for someone that looked like Hayley. Here in Melbourne? In Melbourne. And I won. And I won, I think, I didn't even know. My sister sent the picture in. I won passes to the theatre. But they were very clever because you couldn't go on weekends and you couldn't go on the holidays. So when can a 10-year-old go to the movies? I, th <laughs> I think I went once or something. But that was, yeah, that was my first showbiz experience, actually. But, but given your dad was a professor and, you, and you, your mum's dad was a Pulitzer Prize winner, I mean, a Nobel Prize winner mm -hmm. and so on, I mean, there must have been a pressure for you to go into academia rather than the show business. There was a bit, but um, I knocked that on the head because <laughs> <laughs> I didn't do so well at school. I don't want Chloe to see this. I did great, darling, really. But, um, <laughs> no, I, I wasn't concentrating very well. So when this all happened, I had the option of going on and finishing and doing my matric or leaving school, and I opted to leave because one of my teachers wisely said to me, if you're going to be thinking about singing, you're never going to get through the last year, so, uh, you know, follow what you want to do. So, you know, and, and phew, I'll follow singing. <laughs> but that was the dream? I mean, you wanted to sing? Did you sing at home? Did you prance around in front of the mirror and all that sort of stuff? I did, but, you know, it really just happened. It wasn't something that... I'm consciously aware of that I was following it, just kind of evolved. I, I sang for fun with three other girls and... The um, Soul Four? The Soul Four, yes. How bad were they? <laughs> Pretty bad. Um, <laughs> they were great girls. I'd love to see them again. I haven't seen them in so many years. And, um, <laughs> but we used to three sing in trad, yeah, we used to sing in the trad clubs, you know, um, go down and sing down by the riverside and all that stuff, really out of tune. And, um, and so there's hope for the rest of us. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's right. <laughs> I've got, there's an old clipping here from a 1969 <laughs> newspaper that you haven't seen right. from Sydney and it's, it says a, a fabulous amount Australian girl to star in five million dollar film the article says and it says here's, I'll just, let me read it a pretty 20 year old Australian singer this is from New York has been chosen to star in a five million dollar film produced by the man who discovered the monkeys the girl is Olivia Newton John of Melbourne and then you cut and I'm so excited I could burst Miss Newton -John. <laughs> and then at the end ask whether she would want to return to Australia Miss Newton John answered not right now. This is too groovy. <laughs> I can't believe I'm a star. <laughs> Did you say that? I don't really remember. It doesn't sound like me, really. But you never know. What happened to this movie, The Smash Hit? Nothing. Called, it was called Tomorrow. <laughs> it's actually hysterical. Have you ever seen it? No. It's kind of like um, science fiction with music. It's like we're, we're a rock band, and this man from outer space believed <laughs> That our music could save his planet, so he comes and takes us up in his spaceship. And um, I think now it'd be kind of one of those, you know, cult, cult movies because it's very funny. <laughs> but we have a, a good time somewhere. <laughs> I've hidden it actually. <laughs> Let me stop you there. Stop laughing. <laughs> we'll take a break and we'll come back with Olivia right after this. After the
no, listen, true confession time. I heard the great love of your life that you had the hots for John Travolta. That's not true. Who didn't? <laughs> <laughs> he was lovely. He was a lovely guy. He's a, he's a good friend. He was a good friend. We were never an item, but we were good friends. And you someone know. said then that, uh, the, uh, one of the comments of the people who didn't like the idea of an Aussie accent winning it, someone said that if white bread could sing, it would sound like Olivia newton <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I've heard that one. <laughs> <laughs> what did oh, you say a lot of people white, like white bread, I guess. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> Did you get uh, uh, images again? Did you get tired of the over the years of being the virtuous, virginal Doris Day type girl next door? Um, I think in the beginning, when I was trying to prove that you know I could sing, actually, that it, it probably bothered me. But as time went on, I realised that people like to categorise you, and I was very lucky to have any career of success that I was having at all. So I kind of let it go, and it's okay. People like to put you in a niche, mm. you know. So then along comes Greece. Mm. So then we get black. That was my chance to break out and be brown bread. <laughs> black bread. <laughs> so, yeah, right. Black skin type pants. Black skin type. And a, off the shoulder blouse and, the, mm. and the, the rich red high heel shoes. Yes. What was the reaction? Did, 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 were, were people upset? No, they did loved fans? it. In fact, it was really fun because we filmed that movie for about three months. And I'd been Sandy. I call them Sandy 1 and Sandy 2. And Sandy 1 had been, you know, going around the set like this for a few months. And so the night before I was due to film, we had to try out the makeup and hair and try on the, the clothes and everything. So I dressed up and I got a cigarette and I went out because they were filming. I think John was filming one of his songs. And no one knew who I was. And I had such a great time. I'm flirting with all the guys. I'm in this black outfit. <laughs> and when they realised, it was like, what? Horror of horrors. No, I had a great time with that. It was really fun. It really helped my career. That was really when I got a chance to start doing different kinds of material and do a little more rock and roll. And, and then you do Let's Get Physical. Yeah. Suddenly you grow up. <laughs> Something sexy. Got something a bit risque, yes. Was it true that some, was it, was it Australia or America, where some TV stations actually banned that, uh, uh, the, the musical clip? Utah. In Utah. Just the Mormon city. And the funny thing about that was when I, I filmed a, um, a television show of my concert and I had to do it in Utah. And I was so nervous, I thought, what if no one shows up? But anyway, I guess there are a few rebels in Utah because they did come to the show. <laughs> the sinners showed up again. Yeah, they did. As a young girl. I came here by sea To a new home for my family It welcomed us with open arms A chance to live my dream And there's no Mrs. Latanza, how did you meet Matt? We met um, at Debbie Reynolds' rehearsal studios when I was doing Xanadu, and Matt was a dancer in the show, and he in the movie. And we didn't have a leading man, so they brought Matt in to rehearse the dance numbers for when we got the leading man. And uh, that's how we met. In fact, I was on roller skates, and he's, he came in to do some moves with me, and I thought, hmm. He's nice. <laughs> <laughs> was it love at first sight or just that he's nice? Yeah, and no, I thought he was gorgeous, but I, I had no plans on getting involved with anybody. And um, so we were just friends for a few months and then it kind of grew into a romance. You wrote one of the songs in this new album for Matt mm -hmm. and for Chloe. That's right, yes. Tell me about it. Um, well, all these songs just kind of came to me in a very short period of time. But this one was, uh, I don't know, I was just feeling... I guess in a very loving mood when the song happened and I dedicate it to both of them because they've, you know, filled my life with such a lot. So. No, no other love. Mm. Right. Um, do you want to sing any of it? Mm. You remember the words? Yeah, it's like to hear a little, just a couple of lines. Yeah. I, I want to spend my life with you. No other love could make me feel this way where I can be myself and live the truth. No other love could ever let me be myself. There you go. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was just checking the words. You got, the, back. Did I get it right? you got the words oh, right. Good. <laughs> I have no excuse because I wrote them, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, well, it's interesting. I mean, you wrote that, you wrote that in January of 94, mm -hmm. this year. In February of this year, 
Out came the new idea story about basically you and Matt were splitting up. How do you put up with those sorts of things? I like to keep them guessing, you know, write the song, be the article. No, I look, I don't know. The, the press love to write stuff like that because they, I don't know, if they can't find anything bad to write, they'll create something. Because it sells magazines, I guess. You get poor Princess Di, I mean, she's on every week with some story. Um, um, I deal with it. Sometimes it's upsetting. That article actually was upsetting to me because it's very disruptive for a family, especially for a child that now can read. Yes. You know, and she picks it up and it's, you know, I think it's very destructive. I don't like it at all. You also said at one stage that was one of the reasons you lived in America, that in some ways it was they were hassle-free, it was easy to be almost anonymous in America than around Australia. It's a little more easy because, especially in California, um, there are so many people in the business that they can pick on. That you, get, you can get left out more and um, you can be a little more anonymous. Tell but generally, I've got to say, the press here have been nice to me. I can't, you know, just occasionally they like to have a little gossip. Yeah. Uh, tell me about LA. I mean, you survived the violence and the earthquakes and even the bushfires. I was so lucky. I was here. <laughs> I was here. But your house survived <laughs> I was as well. So lucky. <laughs> I was, I was here for time. the earthquake, I was here for the fires, my friends are saying, can we just follow your travel plans, because I, you know, <laughs> um, I felt terrible, because for some reasons that I couldn't be there, because my friends were in a terrible state, that earthquake was really devastating, and people are still shook up, <laughs> oh, excuse me, <laughs> all shook up, <laughs> uh, it's Elvis again, I don't know, um, but, he's here, <laughs> he's here. But the, um, the fire, I feel I was really looked after by somebody because our house is in, in uh, Malibu, is at the back of, and there are hills right behind us. The fire came right over the hill, went around our house and burnt three houses in front of us and went down the hill. And we lost the deck and we lost, you know, some superficial things, but the house is still standing, which is amazing. Apparently, there were some firefighters that came from the Midwest who were fans of mine who went up to the house and got in the pool and said, I'm going to save her house, and they saved it. <laughs> Is that right? So, and I've never got a chance to thank them. So. <laughs> they're probably not watching tonight. No, they're they? probably not. <laughs> but, but we saw, when you did the interview with Mike Wallacey at the house, mm. we saw there were eucalypt trees around, so trees that were supposed to go up. That, you know, what's really amazing about that, the eucalypts were standing, and the, everyone, you know, was concerned. My mother was always worried about the eucalypts in front of my house because I, I love them, and they reminded me of home. So I had lots of them all around close to the house. They didn't go up. But I, I heard that if you keep them well watered, it's a lot safer, and I think they were well watered, so I was lucky. At least people from the Midwest were yeah. watering it. <laughs> watering them, exactly. It turned cold, that's where it ends. So I told her we'd still be friends. Then we made our true love love. Wonder why. She's doing now Summer dreams Ripped at the seams But oh. The Twenty-five million songs. We had no idea what we should choose. We chose this song. Now, this song was uh, was written by another great Aussie music star, the late great Peter Allen. It won a Grammy as the best song of the year, a couple of years ago, wasn't it? <laughs> One or two years ago. So now with Chong Lim on piano, Chong, uh, she's much prettier than John Farnham. Well, definitely. You know, I'm going to lose my gig now. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 you've never done this before. In fact, you didn't meet Chong till t tonight. No, this is uh, this is our debut, isn't it? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right, Olivia <laughs> and. Uh, Chong Lim on piano, here is Olivia and I Honestly Love You. don't have to 
Forget the lyrics. No. <laughs> it begins Friday. All my life I've been hearing about the man from Snowy River, and it turns out he doesn't even have to be heartfelt songs showcasing the unique talents of Australia's favorite female performer. Featuring the first single, No Matter What You Do. Olivia Newton-John's new album, Gaia. One Woman's Journey. Out now at Brashes. Grand. July the 3rd, 1992. It was a pretty heavy day. Um, it was my brother's birthday. Um, I was in America and went... I'd been in and had some tests in hospital about five days before and had gone away for a vacation on that day and arrived at um, a friend of mine's house in the San Juan Islands, which is a beautiful group of islands above Seattle in America, beautiful spot, and I was sitting on the deck and my father had been ill. I'd just been to Australia um, about a week before that. Everything was happening. I was having tests, my father being ill. I went to have a few days holiday before I was supposed to start a tour of America. I had a band in rehearsal. I was supposed to start the rehearsals on the Monday. This was, I think, a Friday. And um, Matt told me that my father died, and that was the, the first thing. And he, um, I knew he was very ill, but I didn't know. It was very sudden. And um, He had cancer? He had cancer. And so, obviously, that was pretty traumatic, and I knew that I, had to, I was supposed to start work on the Monday. So we had the weekend there, and I went back um, to Los Angeles on the Monday to start and I had a message from my doctor to call and something told, I knew, I knew something was up and, but the amazing thing about this was that Matt had known all along the whole weekend that my tests had come back positive but 
<clears throat> didn't want to make it any worse for me because he thought it was enough to accept the news about my father without telling me a double whammy, which I thought was pretty amazing to keep that to himself totally the whole weekend and not tell anyone. Did he tell you or did the doctor tell you? Um, the doctor told me, but he told me that he had known. So yes. I thought that was a pretty loving thing to do. So I went in there and I thought, well, what else could happen? I mean, <laughs> um, so first of all, I had to assess it's what I was going to do. It's funny you say that because do. you said that you, that you found yourself for the next two days joking and laughing about it. I, I, I don't know. It was, it's my reaction when things go wrong or when I'm nervous or excited, I laugh. And I thought, I think it's a, um, a mechanism. It's a safety mechanism I have. And um, I laughed a lot. I thought, what else could go wrong? I mean, my poor father died on Friday. I, um, I, I've got breast cancer. I've got to cancel my tour. Koala Boo's gone under it. It's got to be it. It comes in threes. Now it's got to be. Please, this is it. So, um, no, laughter did get me through. Because I thought, you, you have to make a decision in life. You either see the positive and you go with that, or you let yourself go into the negative. And I definitely wasn't going to do that. Because I think, and I know that your mind is... 90% with illness, you know, it can create illness and it can cure illness and so I was very determined that I was going to be okay. So but did you face, did you confront the prospect of dying, the fact that this could kill you? Yes, I did. Um, and rejected it? The first, I think the most scary was when I, I'd gone in to see the doctor that day and I'm, you know, keeping up because, because I knew also that I, everyone around me, I was going to need support. And my friend Nancy Tudor, who had lost her daughter a year before, I'd gone through cancer with her and her child. And, and this was she, Chloe's best this friend. This was Chloe's best friend. So she came with me. And we're going, well, Nancy, she, she said to me, you know that you're going to set the tone for this. You know, if you are positive, then everyone around you is going to be positive. So it's really, and it was a very, it was really words of wisdom that she gave me. And so, but when I went home that night and I went to bed, about two o'clock in the morning, I woke up and went downstairs. And I had, that was probably the most frightened I was because I was, it was dread for a while, because you don't really know. I didn't really have, um, I didn't know exactly what they were going to do. And it was terror for a little while. But, you know, I, but I made, I had to make a decision then. I had to decide, do I go with this or do I go with that? And, you know, your mind is very strong, very powerful thing. And, and your mind, you can make things real in your mind. Your mind doesn't know the difference between what you've created and what actually happened. So I decided I was okay. Yes. And, and so, you and know, they, obviously there were moments. I, I, I'd be lying if I said there weren't moments, but I was just, I'm going to be fine. I'm fine, you know. Chemotherapy for how long? I had eight months of chemo. I had surgery first and then um, chemotherapy. For and you months. lost your hair or not? I didn't. No, I was very lucky. I put on, um, it looked very funny, like a tea cosy full of ice. I looked very funny. I looked like Mrs. Mop or something with this um, ice cap on, which helped. Mm. Uh, you've, a couple of the songs in this album are, in fact, one is, is Why Me, mm -hmm. and the other one is about is after, that you write after the chemotherapy. Yeah, one of them's called Why Me, because it says, you know, whenever anything happens, people very often go, Why me? What have I done to deserve this? And stuff. I go, really, don't say why me. Why me, why not me is the thing. Because the truth is that why not you? And maybe there was a reason. I really believe that everything that this happened for a reason to me, maybe. I wouldn't have written these songs had this not happened. I wouldn't be here. <laughs> I wouldn't be thinking. talking to you after all these years had this not happened. But, um, but here's a woman who's, uh, I mean, you'd been very healthy. Mm. You'd, uh, you're a vegetarian for a long time. You'd mm. never smoked, never drunk, never taken drugs, mm. exercised, all these sorts of things. I mean, why you? It's a good question. I think that um, I was under a lot of stress and I was trying to take care of everybody. And it's, I went to a therapist the, the first day. Nancy took me along to her therapist and said, you need to talk to someone, you know, get this out, how you're feeling. Because I tended to be a person who suppressed emotions. And um, if I was upset, I'd push it down. I wouldn't let people often know how I was feeling if I was angry. Because I always had this good girl, nice girl, the image. You never got angry. You never, you know. And that can be very unhealthy because you push it down. And one of the first things this um, psychiatrist said to me was, have you been taking care of everyone, you know? And I said, well, yes, you know, and I told her about my life. And she said, well, you know, you've been breastfeeding everybody. You've got to let them go. You've got to wean people off you. And it was kind of a revelation. I went, oh, my goodness, I hadn't thought of that really. But it was a good image for me. It was like, take care of yourself, because I always was putting everybody else before myself. And I knew that to get well, I had to be... It's a bad thing that we're taught in society, especially as women, that taking care of yourself is a selfish thing because it's really important to take care of yourself because without taking care of yourself, you're not prepared, you're not able to take care of those around you. So I knew that from that point, I had to take care of myself. You said at one stage as well that I think 1980 you said that I'm, I'm afraid of growing old. 
Are you? I said some silly things, didn't I? <laughs> I was afraid of lots of things. I don't really think I'm afraid anymore, which has been a wonderful release for me after going through my scare with breast cancer. I think it released me of all those fears, you know, and I think maybe that was what that was all about, to face, face life, face death, fa face illness. And now I think I could deal with, you know, just about anything. But you're looking pretty good for 25. Thank you, Trey. <laughs> But you also, that's funny because one of those other things you said was that, uh, that, that the breast cancer was probably the best thing that happened you, to you. I know, it sounds, it sounds say, ironic, I know, to say that, but really I think in a lot of ways it was because it made me um, grow up a lot, it made me um, work at my prior priorities and it made me let go of a lot of fears and maybe let go of a lot of things that I didn't need to be doing that I felt I had to be doing. Mm. We'll take a break and we'll come back with Olivia Newton-John. I mean, obviously the environment, I think we all know, the environment is one of your great passions. Mm. But you were, you were heavily onto that kick, I mean, in the best sense, um, before it became trendy, weren't you? I mean, I, I read, was it 1970 that you, uh, you refused to go to Japan because of the killing of dolphins there? Mm. Until they changed policies? That's right. I, um, I've always loved animals, and up until I had Chloe, I think probably animals were my main focus. I think children are as, Im as important to me now, because I think I needed to experience that. But animals, I've always had a great affinity with animals and, and anything, anything living, breathing, being, you know, I think is a right to, a right to be here. So I felt this really strongly and I felt that um, I needed to get this message on, across on her behalf. And I went back to America because Matt had finished the show and we went back and I just had this revelation that I needed to record these songs and I needed to do it in Australia. So I said, come on family, we're packing, we're going back. And so we all went back. And, um, Why, because the, the environment, the mood, the, the songs, vibes all better? these songs, I had like 10 songs and nowhere to go. <laughs> I thought, I, I have to record these. And, but um, weren't they coming to in America? I had a couple happened okay. there, but like the majority of them happened in Australia. Right. And I kind of felt I wanted to do it there because that's where it all, you know, all the music came to me. And the tree song? The tree song, um, I had actually started in the 80s and I started the song and put it in a drawer and I was going through all my old tapes when I was coming back to America and found the beginning of it. And really I'm singing on behalf of the old growth forests that are being mercilessly cut down all over the world. And, you know, we are planting, you know, trees that they're using for, for wood and they're, you know, all these forests that look exactly the same. But the old growth is irreplaceable and it is a home for lots of animals and wildlife and it's something that our children have the right to see. So I kind of wrote that on behalf of them. Just and it's the first couple of lines too. of that one. Can you remember that? Yeah. No, I'm taxing out. Yeah, you are. God, this is a memory test. I better get that tape. Um, I'm tall. I need room to grow. I need the sun in my eyes. My home is the earth below. One day I know I will reach the sky. Don't cut me down, for I'm innocent. Don't cut me down. I am your friend. So that's, that's the beginning of the tree song. Mm. 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 What, what happened to Fern Gully? What's happened there? Have, they haven't, they haven't uh, they flooded it. They haven't that. flooded it yet, but they're um, threatening to. And so that's still ongoing? It's ongoing. You know, Fern Gully is really um, a symbol for what is happening all over Australia. I've really been really concerned, because I mean, everyone writes to me now, because they know that I'm worried about the environment, and I believe they want to put a highway through a koala habitat in um, Queensland, and, and the American government is thinking of putting koalas on the endangered list. Now, this really horrifies me that this, koalas are, kind of the thing that everything comes to Australia to see and we should be pre preserving them in every way possible. I'm sure that if everywhere out there knew that we are in the, in the name of progress destroying things that were irreplaceable because koalas cannot, you know, decide, oh, they're putting a road through here, I'll just buzz off for a couple of years and come back. It doesn't work that way. They're very territorial, they're very shy and we could be killing off one of the largest habitats. So if, I think that we all need to get more involved in 
I, I have this theory that Australia should be proclaimed a world park because it's so beautiful and it's one of the last places on earth that isn't totally ruined and I think it's our responsibility to keep it that way if we can. You've been I doing a TV series too, haven't you, on this, on the environment? Yeah, I have. Um, it's called Wildlife. It's really fantastic. I've been having the best time with that. Yoo-hoo! We're Hello. here. Hope you're not here. You there. It's so much fun to watch. I can't believe this is so beautiful. Yeah. Look how powerful they are. Go ahead Let's and just see. kneel down oh there. Oh my <laughs> goodness. Is it coming out? Yeah, a little bit. Here, I'll open it just a touch there. There we go. Can you believe it? Make you some are big gorgeous. and strong. <laughs> Yeah, it's like ice cream for tigers to oh, get to get a carton say. of milk. Oh, he's just superb, isn't he? Yeah, he is a really good cat. <laughs> okay, you ready? One, two, three! Wow, his feeling, his anticipation was. We'll never know. Freedom My heart like was that. going, his heart was going, and he was just trembling. It was incredible. You imagine, well done, you did it. <laughs> Thank you. All right, let's hear a song now from, uh, from Livy. This is called Don't Cut Me Down. It's just one of the poignant and honest songs from uh, Livia's new album, which is called Gaia One Woman's Journey. Let's have a listen.
Is Australia home now? Yes, it is. I, I'm really spending more and more time. Every time I'm out here, we spend a little more time, a little more time, and I really want to make it home base. Again. If you could sell the houses in America, would yes, that... Yes, they're all on the market. Anyone want Anyone one? Anyone want to buy <laughs> <laughs> would that make going very cheap, very nice. <laughs> would that make the difference? I mean, would you basically have no connection then? Yeah, well, I mean, I have my friends there. That's the hardest thing. But I think they're all kind of... Well, Australia's sounding pretty good. You know, I think I might be able to get them all back here now. All right, let's finish where we started. Mm. Because I want to ask you're you... You're all gone already? Wow, yeah, whack. God. Um, like she can talk, can't she? <laughs> I want to ask you about the other great love in your life. And if you get up and leave now, then I don't care, you see, because I've asked you this question. <laughs> Tell me about your crush on John Farnham. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Jill, forgive me. Oh, I just think that he's just such an incredible... He's always had the most amazing voice. And he's gorgeous, let's face it. He's gorgeous. He's got a wonderful voice, and I hope one day I can sing something with him. He's wonderful. So if he's watching and this camera, yeah. <laughs> any time you'd like to yeah, sing. Yeah, he's great. Love you, happy home. Thank you. Thank At last, you, after 15,000 interviews, thanks for talking to me. Thank you, Ray. Would you please thank Olivia Newton? <laughs>